calm rooms and sensory gardens, creative interventions for a chaotic world. My name is Kara Doherty, and I am a school counselor. I've been a school counselor for the past 17 years. I work at Wall and Paul Pack, and, um, and I'm excited to kind of talk about some creative counseling interventions that can really serve as a support for our students. And I'm Danielle Mangan. I also work at Wall and Paul Pack. I've worked as a special education teacher and as well as a school counselor for the district. I've been in education for 22 years um, and just, I enjoy finding creative solutions for students and um, calm rooms and sensory gardens have become a much recent passion of mine. So I'm excited to talk about some of the ideas that we have and hopefully some things you can integrate into your own schools. So our calm rooms and our sensory gardens here at Wall and Paul Pack really came about through the last three years of listening to our student voices, of identifying what some of the underlying needs have been within our community, and then navigating how to incorporate them here. And, um, and what we're hoping to discuss during our hour today is looking at what are some of the trends that got us to identifying the need for calm rooms, looking at what kind of um, what kind of supports those calm rooms and sensory gardens can provide, and then also looking at, at more of a widespread kind of practical application for how the interventions can help our students reaching out and connecting with us and connecting with where we're at. So what ended up happening was uh, was we've been seeing an increased need and anxiety and depression among our students over the past um, three years, really since the onset of 2020, when our students went home um, in March of 2020, and then they came back to us in the fall, we've seen increased levels of anxiety, increased levels of depression, According to the CDC, one in five adolescents, one in five middle and high school students are displaying symptoms of mental health. Um, we're seeing an increase in our social media pressure that students are feeling. So our students are feeling an increase in anxiety and depression. And then coupled with that, we're seeing really this onslaught of social media an onslaught of kids really frequently being on electronics, being on devices. And when kids came back from school, from the pandemic, they really had had lost some of that stamina that they used to be able to have in academic classes where they were able to sustain um, more of an academic rigor. Compounded with all of this, we've seen a decrease and community-based mental health services available to our students. So they say that necessity is the mother of invention. And we've really seen with a lack of the increased need of our students and the lack of mental health services, we've seen a need for creating creative and innovation, innovative supports for students. So some of the things that we've been doing have been looking at at really focusing in on an account, as a counseling department on building relationships, on creating family fun nights, on we've created a couple of programs where therapy dogs come into our schools, and we've also focused on calm rooms and sensory gardens as really a stopgate for supporting students. Yeah, and so um, before we left for the pandemic, I was still in the classroom, so I noticed even at that point, the use of technology, the, the children were using more technology. Um, and I feel like when I flipped over to the counseling side, that just became increased every year since then. And I feel that coming back into the buildings, we had social distancing at that time. We had um, a hybrid schedule. We had some students in person. We had some students on virtual. It was just a very... Um, chaotic time. And I found that students were looking for a place that they could retreat. They could lose the device. They could relax, have a peaceful environment. And that's when I came across calm rooms. And so in Wall and Paw Pack, when we started our calm room, um, that was where it was from. It was based on a need that the children were saying. The students were coming back. They needed these things. And developing a small space within our classrooms was 
was a, a need that needed to be fulfilled for them to successfully get through the school day. So that's kind of where Calm Room started for me in my journey with them. Um, calm rooms, or sometimes they're called sensory rooms, are designed to promote a quiet, soothing space. So it's a space for students to self-regulate, to learn some coping skills, to manage their stress, their anxiety, um, sometimes just escape sensory overload. Um, and, and in these spaces, I'm in hours right now. So in, in these spaces, we try to um, design it so that it feels peaceful. So soft lighting, um, we always turn half the lights off in this room so that we have a space for, for students who are coming here for academic support. It's still bright on one side of the room. It's kind of darker on soothing on the other side, comfortable seating. Um, we have a really nice sofa that the, the kids love to sit on. Rocking chairs are a great addition to our calm room. Um, soft music, we have some sound machines, sounds of nature, sounds of water. Uh, the fish tank is in the background. The fish tank um, is actually one of the most beloved pieces in this room. They, they love to feed the fish. They love to take care of the fish. They love to clean it. Um, and just listen to the filter sometimes. This, that soft hum of the filter is very soothing to a lot of our students. Um, and it's just a room designed around tranquility. The, the design is supposed to be soothing colors, calm decor, um, free of distraction, noise, so that the kids can come in and they can have a mindful break. They can come in to de-stress, to recharge, refocus, and you know get some skills to learn how to calm themselves when they're overwhelmed or feeling anxious and just you know need to, to walk away and take a break. And as we look at the rise of adolescent mental health, when we look at the rise of anxiety and depression in adolescents, what we're seeing is some really interesting trends and some things that counseling is absolutely something that, and mental health counseling is absolutely something that our students need, but not all of our students can access mental health counseling. So what, what we're endeavoring to do is to put resources in place for students so that way when their anxiety begins to rise, they can self-advocate for themselves. They can have the awareness to start to learn how to regulate some of that stress and regulate some of that anxiety. Because what we notice is when students get stuck in a stress cycle, they're no longer paying attention to academics. They're no longer able to function within the normal classroom. And so by looking at, at teaching students self-regulation skills and then providing a safe environment that has all of the tools that they need in order to self-regulate, we're able to take, take students that would otherwise sit in a classroom, not pay attention, and kind of start spiraling into places of true anxiety, we're able to put supports in place when they're stressed out. We're able to su put supports in place prior to them getting to the place of having a complete meltdown. Yeah, it gives them another place to regain their composure because sometimes I feel like they they went through what they were experiencing. They're able to calm down, but they just need that extra few minutes just to regain their composure, clean themselves up and go back into the classroom focused and ready to learn. Um, and that's the teacher part of me um, appreciates that when a student has a space to go to, they're not doing it in front of the class. Um, take a step away, come back into the room ready to learn. And you know the, the increase in attention that we've seen is really remarkable just by taking those few minutes of a mindful break, just to learn a few deep breathing exercises or, or you know, a tactile exercise um, to help with some of those sensory processing or just anxiety and emotional challenges. Um, you know, it, it just provides another space for them to regain themselves. And our goal in creating calm rooms is to have a K to 12 district approach to our mental health interventions. So one of the, the steps that we took in the beginning of the implementation of this plan was we piloted the program with Danielle in the middle school and she created a calm room and we had a calm room in that space for a year. We saw a lot of success. 
with that, and then we were able to look at our K-1-2 building, our 3-4-5 building, our middle school and our high school, and put comm rooms into each building. So that way, it's a skill our students learn, and then it's a skill that they can employ over the course of time. You know, obviously, when they go to a comm room as a kindergarten student, they're going in a little bit of a different manner than what they're going when they're a high school student. A large part of that, too, is when the students go into those spaces, regardless of what age group they're in, teaching them how to use the manipulatives and things available to them in that room um, so that they're not kind of just walking in and not really sure what to do, which is in, you know, in the beginning, we did see that a little bit, walking them through what certain sensory toys or, you know, are for or um, certain breathing exercises, different spaces in the room, actually telling them what their purpose is, um, regardless of the age group, really does help um, for the students to know what they're supposed to be doing in that room. So some of the benefits that we've seen of the calm rooms is we've seen stress reduction. So our calming spaces provide a tranquil environment to reduce stress for our students and really promote um, a readiness to learn. We found that comm rooms actually line up pretty well with our zones of regulation. So we can use um, an evidence-informed program like zones of regulation as, as a connector piece for our comm rooms. And we can talk to our students about how if you're in the green zone, you probably don't need to go to the comm room. But if you're feeling blue or if you're in the red zone, com the comm room can be one of the toolboxes for getting back into a green zone and being ready to learn. So we're seeing stress reduction. We see an increase in emotional regulation from our students where when they go into the calm room, we're asking them to identify how it is they feel. And we're asking them to then come into the room and say, what are the tools within this room that you can use to get your emotions back to where it is that you need to be to be in class. So not only are the students increasing their ability to use their emotional vocabulary, they're also engaging in the activities that they've learned with their counselors with the paraeducator in the room. We're seeing improved focus, enhanced concentration, productivity from our students. This, our calm rooms serve as a mental health support. So a calm room does not take the place of a student going to see the counselor, but it's used adjacent with that. So a calm room might be used for a student who checks in with the counselor, talks to the counselor, and just needs an extra five minutes before they're ready to return to class. It could be used as a part of a plan that's created with their school counselor. So it's used really in conjunction with our mental health. And we're also using it for sensory issues. So there's different, we've met with, this is kind of an extension of some of the work that the OT does in our buildings to kind of provide that sensory stimulation to having students be calm and ready to return to class. With that, students who are checking into the sensory room or the, you know our calm room here, we document all of that. So it's a very, it's it's very nice to have that data at the end of the week to kind of see um, who checked in, what time, for what reason, what did they do when they were in there? Um, was it a student academic support? Did they just need a mindful break? And a lot of our students, the way we use it, um, they have already met with the counselors. So they've met with the counselors. They've discussed kind of some of these coping skills. And as a team, we've decided that maybe the student would benefit from scheduled sensory visits um, to, to the calm room so that they can um, you know, get those those check-ins throughout the day with a, an adult who's in the room. The room is um, fully staffed in our building, um, which we can talk about a little bit more also. So it, it's just it's just an improved overall well-being. And we're finding that those kids who do get those breaks, whether it's for mental health, academic support, um, it just enhances their creativity. It enhances their ability to focus, and it's improving our relationships, which we have a big push for that in our district to just make sure we're making connections with students. Um, having those relationships have been imperative to getting them to pull ahead of this, you know, sometimes um, stressful situations for them. So um, just building those relationships, having those people that they can call their go-tos, um, that they feel safe around and you know, help them regulate their emotions throughout the day.
similar to a comm room, but a little bit different are our sensory gardens. The sensory garden started off very small. So I had um, a small group of students who expressed to me um, that their interest was gardening. They love to be outside. It was something they do at home, something they do with their family. Um, and they would love to be able to do that in the building. Um, and we're lucky enough, we have a beautiful sunny area. The one side is full of windows, very unused space. A lot of our spaces that we are repurposing were just storage areas or spaces in the building that were not being utilized. Um, so the kids and I cleaned it up. They actually built a wicking bed, which is like a, it's an indoor planter. So the, our sensory garden um, right now is indoor in our building. So they built a wicking bed. It's a self-watering flower bed, basically. Um, and we planted things in there that would relax them, that would reduce their stress, any kind of plants that touch the senses. So anything you can touch, anything you can smell, anything that you can taste. Um, a lot of the kids will go up there and taste the herbs. So it's it just provides another experience. Um, it's another outlet, a little bit of physical activity. Um, it gets them moving a little bit. Um, and just after reading a lot of the research about sensory gardens, it really um, reduces negative thoughts. There's a lot of research stating that nature activities in general, whether it's indoor, outdoor, planting, um, just reduces a lot of the negative feelings, lowers depression, puts you in a better mood. Um, and it also promotes um, cooperation. I find that the kids who come up to the sensory garden often come in groups. It's a great place for me to do some small group work with them. Um, it's, it's very much cooperative. So there's a lot of empathy, um, a lot of coping skills we can teach throughout there. And then again, relationships, relationships and connections in creating something, watching it grow, and then, um, you know, being able to talk about it. So it's a really great experience for our students to have. And sometimes all of these interventions, when we're talking about calm rooms and sensory gardens can feel like overwhelming to start. It can feel like it's one more thing on our plate as a school counselor. And how is it that we're going to fit that in the school day? Our kids are in classes. Our kids are here. Our kids are there. And one of the really cool things that we found is by incorporating this into our school day as a cultural piece, as a support for our teachers, we've actually seen an increase in the number of students who are asking over the over the past two years that we've had a calm room we've seen an increase in the number of students that are asking to use the calm room and an increase in the number of teachers that are sending the kids to the calm room in a really proactive manner because our our teachers are seeing that their classes are happening differently because students are showing up ready to learn so while it's a big ask in up front we're finding that it's actually decreasing our need for interventions once we put it into place and had it kind of started running and successful. Yeah. And in the beginning, um, it did feel like a lot more work. And it 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 now has become much more part of the routine. A big part of that was the teacher buy-in. Um, at first, you know, nobody wants to hear, oh, you know, so-and-so doesn't want to come to your class right now. They need to do this or they need to do that. Um, but once they saw the benefits and they saw that the kids came back ready to learn and that it really, in most cases, was a 10-minute break, um, the teachers started to buy into it and then would send the students there on their own. So then it became one less thing for me as the counselor to do because the students were already down there. I could just make it part of my rounds. I could do my check-ins from there. Very easy to pull small groups to do some small group work um, because there was that connection with the teachers um, that it, it just, and it didn't happen right away. It can, You have to kind of work at that a little bit. Um, but now that we're in full swing, that is really not a problem. And, and it really is beneficial to the teachers. They see the benefit, the students see the benefit. And I, um, from the counseling standpoint, see the mental health benefits. So um, yeah, and being able to connect that back to the curriculum, there's a lot of times, whether it's in the calm room and we're reading a story that maybe relates to something they're doing in ELA, or maybe they're redoing some work that the science teacher needed us to redo an experiment, it's hands-on. A lot of the manipulatives down here coordinate. Um, 
so that there is a connection to the curriculum, especially with the sensory garden. Um, we have seventh grade does a life skills. Um, there's a whole plant section in their curriculum about the life, um, the life cells and um, watching plants grow. And, and it's very easy to connect that to um, the science curriculum. Again, there's a lot of teacher buy-in for that. So not only are we using the sensory garden, our science teachers are using the sensory garden as a teaching tool. So the students are used to going there they're, and they go in in groups. And it's sometimes students who don't need the calm room that go also. So the, the, the stigma of I need help or I don't wanna go there, that's not where I should be. Um, that really doesn't exist because there's such a flow of kids in and out that they don't see it as a negative. They see it as a positive. This is something that's going to help me or it's someplace I want to go. Um, and it, it just benefits them all around. As we look at the stigma that can sometimes be attached to certain groups for accessing mental health treatment, one of the things that we were particularly aware of was looking at who are our students and who are our students that seek out school counselors, who are our families that regularly seek out treatment and care on a mental health spectrum. One of the things that we know from diving into the PAYS data, not only for our, for our district, but overall for the state of Pennsylvania, when we look at the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, when we look at the national trends of mental health, one of the things that we're seeing is that we're seeing that marginalized groups have a, a stronger incidence of mental health need and a decreased incidence of seeking treatment. So some of those groups are, we're looking at, at groups that are under um, underrepresented within our school, whether or not that's um, groups that would be considered minority groups, or if we're looking at our LGBTQ plus population, if we're looking at our special education population, if we're looking at our population of students that come from a lower socioeconomic bracket. A lot of those students we're seeing with increased um, opportunities for needing more support. We're seeing students that are seeing an increase in anxiety, an increase in depression, but because of what's going on around them, they also have more barriers to accessing treatment. They have more barriers to raising their hand in class and saying, hey, I wanna go talk to my school counselor. They have more barriers for their parents being able to, um, to use our community-based mental health. So what we really wanted to do is we wanted to address not only the mental health need within our school, but also the barriers to treatment within our school. So when we started really looking down and peeling back the layers to what looks like stigma to students, to what looks like an inability to access treatment, a lot of it is a perception that I don't need mental health a perception of, I don't need to talk to a counselor, a perception of that's not for me, that's somebody else. So what we wanted to do with our calm rooms and our sensory garden was to make them cultural, was to make them something that as a, as a Wall and Paul Pack student, we self-regulate because we're all human beings. We all have feelings and we all need to be ready to learn in school. So what we did is we shifted our focus from talking about mental health as something out there that other people do to talk, start talking about our feelings as something that every single person has. And we started talking to our teachers, to our parents, to our community about how we want to teach self-regulation skills at the younger ages. So that way, when students are ready for careers and college and beyond, they know how to show up and ready. They know what to do when they feel sad. They know what to do when they feel stressed. They know what to do when they feel overwhelmed. And so by creating a calm room, that's a fun room. There's Legos on the wall. There's a fish tank. There's a fireplace. It's comfortable. It's cozy. It's someplace I want to go because it feels good to be in that room. We're shifting that stigma of if I need help, with my mental health, I need to go to, I need to raise my hand and make an appointment and go to somebody's office where I might not be comfortable because I might not have ever gone there before, where there's a whole process to get in there when we've shifted it to it's a calm room. It's a space for you to self-regulate, for you to reach out and connect 
with the people that are just a part of your community, we've seen this shift in students being able to access the services. Yeah, and you know, with that, some of the, the practical tips that um, if you were going to try to implement um, a calm room, I would say definitely start small. So this room is actually, it's a, it's a large room. It's an unused classroom in this building that we were given. Um, it started out as a corner. So if you're looking to implement some of the, the ideas, you know, I, I would suggest don't overwhelm yourself with it. Just start small. And then as, as it becomes more, um, you'll see the students, will, they will ask for certain things. And a lot of the things in our room are student driven. They are things that the students have asked for. They are things that the students enjoy. Um, it's based on their interests, based on their needs. Um, and I will just say um, practical stuff to do, you know, documentation is, is really key for this, um, especially as the days go on, um, you forget who's coming down here, who came down for what. So having documentation logs about that, um, we have power professionals who staff our room. Um, that was huge in making the room successful here. Um, it, it allowed for consistency. The students know it's open. It's open every day. It's open every block. And there's a trusted adult in the room all the time. So for us, that was huge. Um, when the children come in, they have to sign, they have to sign in with one of one of our paraprofessionals who are here. Um, we document student name. We document the time that they came in because sometimes you start to see patterns of um, maybe they can't tell you when their difficult time of the day is, but I can go back and see every day at 1050, you were in that room. So what's going on during that time? And it leads to a lot of beneficial conversations, having that data in front of you. Um, where you can see the reason why they came in. Was it a mindful break? Was it an academic support? Was it a sensory need? Um, lots of different reasons why the kids come down and it's nice to have that documented somewhere um, so that we can share that file and then go back and look at our students and see exactly what are they doing down there. Uh, we also monitor the time. We monitor how long the students stay in the room and that's a huge part to the teacher side of this is making sure they're not missing that academic time because we're not looking to take away from their day. We're looking to enhance their day. So the more productive time they have in the classroom, the better. Um, so monitoring how long they're down here, we have timers. The kids even know they'll come in, they'll set their own timer. They put it on the board. The timer goes off. They're ready to go back and they enter class in a better mood um, and more attentive, ready to learn. Um, organization. A lot of times the paraprofessionals in the room will help organize because, uh, you know, even when I'm overwhelmed, I feel like if I clean something up, I feel better. So sometimes the kids just come down, they bring binders, binders of stuff, and they bring it to the ladies and they say, help me clean this up. They organize it. They get their folders in order. 10 minutes, they're back to class, ready to learn. Um, a big part of this room is during lunch. We have a lot of students who have social anxiety during lunch. Lunch is overwhelming. There's a lot that goes on in there. It's noisy. Um, so we encourage students to eat together in the lunchroom, but then if they're done and they need to get out of there, they're allowed to come down here, take the rest of their lunch. Um, again, nice little small groups come down here. So they're still socializing. They might play a quiet game. They might just zone out for 10 minutes. Um, they might rock in the rocking chair a little bit. They might play on the Lego wall. Um, they'll find an activity that they enjoy and it reduces that social anxiety in the cafeteria, um, which again, relieves me of a lot of time too. So in the beginning, it's a lot of time you're devoting, but as these things start to happen and the kids know how to access it, it actually frees you up to help a lot of other kids at the same time too. Um, one of the big rules that we put in place this year um, was no cell phones. And we weren't sure how that was going to go over because last year we did allow the students to have cell phones in the room. Um, we found that they'd come in, they'd zone out on the phone and they really wouldn't take advantage of the materials and the manipulatives that we have in the room. So this year we decided no cell phones and uh, we've seen double the turnout down here. The kids don't want the phones as much as we think they do when you make it that they can't have it in a warm space um they do not mind it they put it away 
and it's it really is a true mindful break no social media no social stress they're not looking for the messages um and really it it was a worry in the beginning and it really has turned out to be fantastic and um the kids are using the materials and using them appropriately and functioning and being able to regulate their emotions throughout the day much more effectively even with a 10 minute break. And it's interesting because the program started, our comm room started in the middle school. And they, so for the first year, students were allowed to have electronics within the room. The second year, when we began in the high school, we started with the, me the positive message to our students that this is an unplugged room. Mm -hmm. This is a room to come, to relax, to reconnect with other people. Um, but that we're unplugged. So we're not on cell phones, we're not on iPads, even though we have a push within our district to be a one-to-one -one district, which is wonderful. All of this technology is great, but all of this technology is a lot. Um, so what we found is we started the year with, um, with our high school students having an unplugged space and our high school students use it. And I know that it sounds like, like a rosy kind of picture to say they come in, and, but they do, they come in, there's a, there's a specific shelf with cubbies where they put their cell phone. So they come in, they put the, they turn their cell phone off. They put their cell phone in the cubby. They pick up their timer. They set their timer and then they go where in the room that they want, whether or not they're in the big cushy, uh, um, beanbag chairs, or if they're in our high school room, we also have a treadmill desk that if the students want to look, flip through a book, or if they want to do a little bit of work while they're walking at the treadmill desk, they can go over and use that. Um, a lot of our activities seem to work regardless of the age. So we have a Lego wall that our mm -hmm. kindergarten students use. And we have a Lego wall that our 12th graders use. And what we found is that they're all children. They're all kids. And, and the fidgets and the self-regulation skills that we're using at the elementary school are working really well at the high school level as well. Whether or not we're looking at weighted blankets, if we're looking at at the sensory garden kind of experience of having having smells and having textures that really work well for our students. We're seeing it really work well across the board. The two biggest obstacles that we faced in beginning a comm room and the two biggest obstacles that anybody's gonna face in the start of this process is money and budgets, as well as teacher buy-in. So how, one of the ways in which we were able to really impact and address the budgetary concern of starting a sensory garden or a comm room is we began small. We began with the corner of a room. We began with a potted plant. We began small and manageable, and we kept track of data. ASCA, as well as PSCA, is a big fan of us as school counselors being data driven and truly in this process, us being able to keep good data made a huge difference in the piece of attacking the budget, which was grant writing. We received several different grants to create the comm rooms within each of our buildings. Some of our grants were smaller grants that were based on community foundations, donor choice type programs. Some of our other grants were larger national grants that we applied for and did receive. Our biggest takeaway in our grant writing process was having good data. Having a paraeducator in the room is the cost that the, the a financial cost that our district takes on. But when we're able to say that that paraeducator in the room saw a thousand students in a year, we're able to see a huge impact for one position. Um, so that has created a lot of difference in our grant writing. The other thing that made a huge impact in our grant writing was having students be involved in writing the grants. At the high school level, the middle school level, and the elementary level, all of our levels, when we've written grants, we've had student voice included. We've had students that have been integral to the writing of those grants, which has allowed us to say that this is a need that our students identify, and this is a need that our students are going to take on. So starting small, 
um, has helped us with the financial aspect of this, as well as seeking out grants. Um, we've had grants from, for example, the Cook Center, um, which is a national um, nonprofit that looks at SEL and mental health um, initiatives within schools. We received a grant last year for our, um, our sensory garden, and that was through the PA Farm and Agriculture Farm to School Grant, um, which is, a, you know, it's a state grant, and they were gracious enough to give us that money for um, a greenhouse outside. So the students really wanted to move their indoor sensory garden into an outdoor sensory garden. We have some big plans for that. So they are actually working um, actually with our technology department um, for tech ed, and they are actually building the greenhouse as we speak outside so that we can um, continue to grow the program and, and continue to see effective results. Our other grants happen through our PTA. Um, mm -hmm. Both the state PTA and our local PTA have, have different grant opportunities that we've been able to take advantage of, as well as, um, as our local hospital had some grant opportunities that we were able to access to look at, at reduction in our overall community um, need for mental health. So we've been able, so one of our, our hurdles and our obstacles really has been addressed through grants. The other big obstacle that we faced was teacher buy-in. When we initially tossed out the idea of a comm room, we had people saying, what are you talking about? Like, you don't need a comm room. You need to get to class and do your work, right? That was, that was the initial conversation when we ran around. But then we started talking to students and we started to say to students, how many of you in this class have asked to go to the bathroom not because you needed to pee, but because you wanted to get out of class and breathe for five minutes. And from elementary to high school, you ask that question and everybody raises their hand. Because I'll tell you, there have been times that I've said, oh, I'm, I've been in a meeting and I've gotten up to go get a drink of water or to go to the bathroom. But what I really needed was a mental health break for just mm -hmm. five seconds. I need to regroup. I need to breathe. I need to come back. Our students were saying the same thing. Our students were saying, we're not going to the bathroom because we need to go to the bathroom. We're going to the bathroom because we need a break. And having our kids be able to engage in that honest conversation and then having our kids say, and it's gross to have to go to the bathroom for a mental health break because I don't want to be in there when I just need to breathe for a minute because I don't want to breathe that in. So we were able to say, oh my gosh, this is where our kids are. So we started sharing that information with teachers. We started talking to teachers about what do you need in your classroom? Forget about like whatever we might think about a calm room or a safe space. What do you as a teacher need? And our teachers started saying, we need students that are sitting ready to learn. We need students that can build up their stamina to be in class for a full period, for a full block. So we started identifying problems that our students were having and identifying the problems that our teachers were having that were lining up to say the same thing. When we had, when we came back from COVID, when we came back from wearing masks, our students were not accustomed to sitting in a classroom for a full day. When our kids were on remote learning, they were getting up and down. They were going into the kitchen for a snack. Yeah, they were taking yeah. their dog for a walk. They were building in breaks that are pretty natural for most people's lives. And then we had them come back to school and sit in a classroom for seven hours a day. They weren't ready for that. Yeah. And so when we started talking to about buy-in from our teachers, we needed to be able to identify the problem that the teacher was experiencing in the classroom and then show how this intervention met that need much quicker than anything else. We can leave an anxious, stressed out, distracted kid in a classroom. We can leave them all there all day long. They're gonna learn nothing all day long and they're gonna be disruptive to those around them. So by being able to speak with our teachers, by being able to do focus groups with students, with teachers, identify their needs and connect their needs to this intervention. We saw a big difference in the way that our teachers were viewing the room and the way then our teachers were using the room. The fact that the room was staffed, I felt like the supervision part of it also met that teacher need. Um, 
rather than just sending the students out into the hall, they go to the bathroom, they get a drink, they wander a little bit, you're not sure, that was a long break, you've been gone for five minutes, that all disappeared because they knew they were going to the calm room. There was an adult there, they were going to check in, um, and it really lessened the amount of hallway traffic, um, which led to a lot of, you know, a lot less discipline problems in the bathrooms, in the hallways. Um, so the teachers seeing that piece of it also um, allowed us to overcome that initial, um, I'm not sure what this room really, its purpose serves kind of point. So um, yeah, the supervision part of it really did help a lot of that too. So when we're seeing the impact of our comm rooms, the impact of our comm rooms have been felt on multiple different spheres. One of the places where we're seeing a huge impact for our comm room is in our academics. We're seeing students utilize our comm rooms to regroup themselves, to go back to class to focus. Our teachers also utilize the comm rooms as a spot for, for students who need to take a test that need a quiet environment if they need a test read out loud. Our teachers are able to use the comm room as a support for their students from an academic st standpoint. So we're seeing improvements in our student population based on that. Another place that we're seeing differences in our students um, based on our comm room is behaviors. We're seeing a decrease in disruptive behaviors within the bathroom. We're seeing a decrease in our students that are in the lunchroom or wandering the hallways, not really where they're supposed to be, um, not really behaving how they're supposed to. We're seeing a change and a shift in our students because they have a spot to go when they need to take a break. And they're making connections too. So those students who really weren't sure what they should be doing or they felt awkward or kind of out of place, uh, having the consistency of the calm room and the same faces down here at different points dur during the day, um, they will come to me and say, can I just have five minutes with um, Mrs. M? Because I know that there's a relationship there. There's a, there's a, a trust that they've built from coming down to the room, talking about what they need. Um, and it really alleviated a lot of the, I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to be or what I'm supposed to be doing because they have that safe space when, you know, the counselors, and we are lucky enough to have three counselors in our building, but sometimes we're all three handling other things. So it's just that extra layer of support, that extra relationship, that extra spot to um, meet, the, meet the student needs and build relationships in the building. When we're looking at, at just the frequency of use, one of the things that has allowed us to keep comm rooms in place and have allowed us to increase the number of comm rooms that we have across the district was looking at the frequency of use within our buildings. So when we look at the frequency of use, we have about 900 students, 900 plus, almost 1,000 students in our middle school, and our frequency of use is pretty high for the building. Yeah, and we are, last year, I believe we ended the year at about 2,500 entries for the year, and we're approaching 1,000, and it's, you know, mid-November, end of November. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really increased this year. Um, I feel like they had a year to get used to what the room has been designed for, and they came in this year knowing it was here. They knew the consistency would be there um, and they they keep seeking it out. So they seek it out, you know, for a, a variety of reasons. And um, a lot of our IEP students, a lot of our 504 students, students who need special accommodations, um, students who are having some social anxiety, they're finding a very peaceful environment that they are able to regulate themselves, learn some coping skills, participate in some groups and really function so much better throughout their school day. And our when we look at the frequency of use, that's how many individuals have come through the room. Right. Some of those individuals come in the room for five minutes. Some of those individuals come in the room to take a test. Mm -hmm. Some of those individuals come in the room to take part in a support group. So we're using the room in a couple different manners. It is a pretty large room. So we do have that flexibility to create a couple of different individual spaces within the room. But what we're not seeing is students eloping from class and us spending an hour searching down one student. Our students, we, we've removed the need to elope from class. We've, we've identified 
how it is that student can have that need met in a safe way to then return them to class pretty quickly. We've had positive feedback from both students and parents. Yeah, and I can't tell you how many parents have called in. The students will go home um, and say, I went to the calm room today. And then the parents will call and be, you know, what is that? What what do they mean by that um, if they're not familiar with the room? So um, parents who didn't know that it existed and then their children go home and talk about it in such um, a happy manner and the, the, the mannerisms that they talked about it and, um the emotions that were associated with the room, the parents are really hearing and resonating with and just so thankful that the space exists for them to have a spot throughout the day that they feel like they're home. Um, it avoids that text to mom in the middle of the day, I'm not having a good day, come get me, I don't feel good. Um, a lot of times the kids, instead of doing that, will come down here and talk to one of the ladies in the room, get a little snack, sit down for a minute and they're ready to go about the day. So it really, um, it's helping the parents in a lot of ways too. So the feedback from parents has been very, very positive. Um, the student testimonials, I mean, every student that is accessing the room could tell you something that they love about it. Um, the one, one of my favorite stories was I do crunch lunches down here. So we do career lunch. We bring in community members to talk about different careers. Um, we invite them down into this space because it's just warm and it's just a nice space in the big, in the building to do that. Um, and then students who want to sign up to hear about that career do so and bring their lunch down here and they eat as a group. Um, it's called almost like a family dinner table. They're eating their dinner. They're talking to this community member about their career. Um, and there are students that sometimes come down into those crunch lunches that have never stepped foot in this room, didn't even know the room existed in the building. And now they came in, they look, they're like, wow, this is great. Um, and then they'll come back and say, you know, can I have a five minute break? Um, didn't sleep well last night, or I really, I failed my test. Can I redo it downstairs? You know, it, and it's a very, it's seamless for them to come down here and be able to access the room. And it provides me with a lot of feedback that maybe I wouldn't have gotten until we saw that failing grade from that student in the classroom, or the teacher mentioned that there was a behavior. Um, it kind of catches it before that point so that we can you know, come up with a plan uh, for success for each student. So yeah, there's a lot of student testimonials, a lot of parent feedback, um, all positive. I really, mm -hmm. I have, I could not think of anything negative um, other than they wish that there were more rooms like this. Um, we, we were very lucky in, in um, the particular grant that we wrote for this one was um, our Wayne County um, Systems of Care. Um, was provided a large amount of money for us to be able to do this in the middle school. Um, and it, it really has benefited thousands of kids. And as we're looking at, at creative solutions for our common problems, one of the things that we find is that the solutions that worked 10 years ago don't work anymore because we're living in a different world than where we were 10 years ago. And so by it, embracing things like calm rooms, sensory gardens, creative options for our students, we're really able to kind of keep getting closer to meeting the trends um, and the needs of adolescent mental health. It allows our students to really decrease stress and anxiety, allows them to take ownership of their own emotions and, and help regulate themselves while also addressing the stigma of help seeking within our community. Thank you so much for coming and joining us to talk about calm rooms and sensory gardens. Danielle and I are available by email if you have any questions for us, if you want to have a conversation about some different things that we could do to support you and creating some of these spaces within your school. It's been a truly exciting process for us to get to um, to do something fun, to do something different with our kids, to really um, embrace gardening, to embrace mindfulness with our students. Thank you so much. Yes, thank yes, thank you. And even for yourselves, um, you know, the work we do is is a lot. It's a lot to take in some days and incorporating some of these calm room, um, incorporating some of these calm rooms and sensory garden, 
into your school day, really, it will benefit you as well. Um, and I would suggest start small, take bits and pieces of what you can. Again, you can reach out to Kara and I, um, tips and tricks, maybe some, some ideas we can try to work together to come up with some solutions. But um, overall, you will feel the benefit and the students will feel the benefit. And together, the productivity will be amazing. Thank you. Thank you.